appreciate it. I mean, I always appreciate it when people uh, come out to events that we have here at the library, but especially um, on a night like this. So thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jim Ramsey. I'm the head of adult services here at the library. So that just means that I'm in charge of the events, classes, workshops, discussions, lectures um, for adults here, in addition to the reference desk and uh, various other things. So um, again, I want to welcome you to this, the fourth lecture of 2018 in our ongoing series called Scholar for Life uh, that we present in conjunction, in partnership really, with the uh, UW Speakers Bureau. Uh, they've been an amazing partner. Uh, we've been doing this for three years. I see a lot of familiar faces. I, I Sure, a lot of you have been to past lectures in this series, um, but the Speakers Bureau has really been essential to, to this whole partnership. And um, this series, that again, we call Scholar for Life, it takes the Wisconsin idea as its starting point. And a lot of you know are familiar with, with the Wisconsin idea. Um, the series aims to promote lifelong learning, intellectual curiosity, and engagement between academics and the community um, as a whole. You can find uh, more information, including some recordings, not all, but some recordings of some of the uh, past lectures at midlibrary.org slash SFL. Midlibrary.org slash SFL. And you can come talk to me afterwards if you have any other questions. Um, so this series is brought to you by a unique four-way partnership that includes the library, of course, we're the ones who's hosting the event, uh, the Speakers Bureau, which uh, coordinates all the logistics with uh, the speakers. Uh, third, our speaker um, himself, who uh, I'd like to note with appreciation, is volunteering his time to be here tonight, as do all of the speakers uh, at UW Madison Speakers Bureau. The fourth partner in this uh, relationship is all of you uh, who contribute to uh, events like this by actively engaging um, with our speakers. There will be time for Q&A uh, at the end. Um, so a uh, couple quick programming notes. The final lecture of, uh, yeah, go ahead and grab it. I kind of ran out. Uh, the final lecture of this year, of uh, a little less than a month, uh, paleoanthropologist John Hawks, who's um, part of the team who discovered and described the Homo Nalini fossil in the Rising Star Cave complex uh, in South Africa. It was featured in National Geographic, uh, etc. Uh, he is going to be speaking as part of the uh, Wisconsin Science Festival and as part of this series on Thursday, October 11th. That's going to be at the Performing Arts Center near the high school. So, um, so put that on your calendars. There's also a flyer on, on your way out. Um, also flyers about other events that we have. Uh, so my goal with this series, um, this Scholar for Life, has been to select topics that are both interesting and, more often than not, topical. Uh, so just a, a quick recap, our first lecture back in February 2016, um, one week before Super Tuesday, uh, was uh, the mathematician Jordan Ellenberg talking about uh, mathematics of choice as it relates to elections. Uh, then in October of 2016, uh, Jennifer Ratner Rosenhagen, an expert in the history of philosophy, talked to us about anti-intellectualism in American history. Uh, I don't know why that was topical, but uh, it was. Uh, in March of 2017, uh, Professor David McDonald uh, talked to us and gave us a historian's perspective on Putin's Russia. Um, that, we had an overflow crowd for that. I know we unfortunately had to turn people away. He is giving that same lecture September 26th at the Monona Public other side of town. So uh, again, that's uh, David McDonald. He was a professor of mine um, at the University of Wisconsin, and it, it's a great talk. Uh, earlier this year, we had a historian, Alfred McCoy, talking about uh, the decline of U.S. empire, the challenge posed by China, etc. So uh, of course, not every topic is necessarily a, a pleasant one, uh, but they are nonetheless important to consider if we want to make sense of the world we live in. Um, one quick note, some more perceptive among you will notice that uh, the talk, uh, the title of the talk has changed from the one that was originally advertised, although fear not, um, if you are uh, information on the European far right, it is a very closely uh, related topic, and Professor Mel will be happy to discuss that. So, um, our guest tonight 
He is a specialist in the history of modern Europe, especially France, in the 19th and 20th centuries. His teaching and research interests focus largely on society and politics, ranging from the transformations of rural society to the history of European socialism and communism, the history of nationalism, voter behavior, and, more recently, the contemporary extreme right. He wrote his first book on peasant communism in France and is currently completing a study that uses the border region of Alsace and Lorraine to discuss changing conceptions of national belonging in 20th century France. In addition to his work with the History Department, uh, he has directed the University of Wisconsin Center for European Studies and served as director of the UW Study Abroad Program in Aix-en-Provence. He also works with students in the professional French master's program who are interested in contemporary French politics and society, issues like immigration, social movements, and European affairs. I should also mention he is the current chair of the uh, Department of History at UW-Madison. Please join me in welcoming their colleagues. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for coming out. Uh, if, if, I was, if we were on the UW campus tonight and I was teaching a class at this time, my students would be working on their pants on Bascom Hill, and my classroom would be sort of empty because as soon as the weather gets nice, they lose their motivation. Uh, and I would also want to add that you know, one of the things I know a lot of you may be senior auditors at the UW Madison, and we have a growing number, it's really interesting, of uh, adults who are uh, <laughs> sitting in on classes. And I think it's really great because it shows, I mean, it might be great for you, but it's great for my students and our students because it helps them understand that learning isn't just something that they do between the ages of 18 and 22. Uh, and that's something that when you're 18, it's sort of important to understand. You know, they see somebody who is, you know, could be their parent taking a reading seriously, for example, and doing it is much more in depth than they are, all of a sudden they wake up. Good. So today I'm going to talk about a not so uplifting topic, which is the new European terrorism and historical perspective. And it's a good time to think about it. I'll try to give you a few pointers why I think it's a timely moment to think about it and why a historical approach could be useful. And these are events that you will remember, the events I'm going to talk about at the beginning. Uh, you'll remember that my wife, my students, my 18-year-old students in my class this semester who probably weren't that aware of this when they were teenagers. So almost four years ago, in January 2015, terrorists in Paris, three terrorists, launched a brutal assault on the editorial offices of the French Satirical Weekly, which is known as Charlie Hebdo, Charlie is doing it, right? which was in the heart of Paris. And ten journalists and cartoonists were slaughtered at their death. They targeted this publication. It's a very satirical publication. There's a lot of stuff that's in really bad taste, right? They targeted Shabli Abdu because it had published satirical representations of the Prophet Muhammad. Two days later, one of their accomplices formed a Jewish supermarket, a uh, kosher supermarket, on the outskirts of Paris, just you know, 100 meters outside of Paris, taking hostages, killing four people, and the terrorist was later uh, killed in a terrorist attack. And you can see here that the, the police are setting off bombs, right? Uh, flash bombs in order to stun the terrorists and take the supermarket by bombs. So these terrorist attacks, and it's very interesting that this attack on the Jewish supermarket is linked to the, an attack on its historical weekly. These attacks shocked French society. Uh, and it led to an outpouring of solidarity with the victims. It's estimated that over 1.5 million people demonstrated in Paris, and about as many people demonstrated in other towns in France, right, uh, under the banner of, and I'll show you the banner, I am Charlie, je suis Charlie in French. So identifying with the newspaper and saying that they embodied the newspaper. And these were the largest demonstrations in 20th century France. So this is a big deal to get 3 million people, you know the French demonstrate all the time. Uh, it's a big deal to get 3 million people in the streets in France. Ten months later, on November 15th, 2015, terrorists struck again at multiple locations in Paris. 
They set off bombs at a soccer stadium just north of Paris where the president of France was attending a soccer game. They machine gunned Parisians sitting in cafes in eastern France, and they entered a concert hall in the heart of Paris known as the Bataclan, where there was a rock group performing, and they massacred some 90 fans attending a rock camp, a rock camp, rock concert, I'm sorry. So on that day, about 130 people in Paris died under a hail of terrorist bullets. Fast forward a year later, I was in France at the time, on July 14, 2016, the French national holiday, where Nice, on the Riviera in southern France, right, a Tunisian truck driver whose name was Mohamed Boulet, who was a legal permanent resident of France, uh, got in a truck, a big truck, and drove down at very high speed a promenade, promenade, right next to the sea, which is called the English people's promenade, promenade des Anglais. And he mowed down hundreds of civilians and killed 86 of them. Right? It was a sort of a truck terrorist attack. Uh, and over 400 sustained injuries. What was interesting about this terrorist who was shot dead by the police was that, as far as we can tell, he was self-radicalized. So he didn't, there was no terrorist network. Right? He claimed to have been acting under the orders of ISIS, but a French police investigation never uncovered any kind of connection. Uh, so he was almost like a lone wolf. So all told, since 2015, 250, 246 people have died in France in terrorist attacks. Uh, I don't want to scare you away from going to France. It's a great place. I go there, it's pretty safe. Your chances of getting, you know, killed in a terrorist attack are probably lower than dying in a car accident. So I don't want to scare people away here. Uh, so the question is, how are we supposed to understand these attacks, right? Did they represent a new form of Islamic terrorism, right? Did, was it an attack on French republicanism, on French democracy, by Muslims who feel excluded from French society? Uh, were these attacks the work of foreign terrorist organizations? They're not, it's not really a French affairs. Foreign terrorists operating on French soil. And should France regulate freedom of the press? Right? So that it does not offend the religious beliefs of an increasing number of its citizens. There are about seven, you know, there are different, we don't exactly know how many Muslims there are in France for complex reasons, but there are probably about seven million Muslims in France, a bit under 10% of the population. So there's a very significant Muslim population. So for historians, for people like me, there's nothing more challenging than analyzing recent events. Right, for the borderline between history and political science, because their meaning has yet to emerge. Right, so you need distance in order to situate events historically, and how much distance you need is the subject of a lot of discussion among historians. But I think we have sufficient distance today to now to situate this what I would call a new wave of terrorism historically. Right, uh, and. The only thing I would say here is that the interpretation I'm going to give you today is surely going to change over time. So in 40 years, well, you won't be around, and I probably won't be around, but if somebody were to come to Middleton Library and give a talk about terrorism in Europe in the early 21st century, they probably have a very different explanation than the one I'm going to propose today. Uh, okay, so I'd like to begin by going back on the attack against Charlie Hebdo, Charlie Hebdo, in the kosher supermarket. Because they, these, this attack, these two attacks need to be understood together. And they were very shrewd in a way that they attacked central pillars of French republicanism. And republicanism really means democracy, right? The first pillar that they were really attacking is the concept that France is a secular state, which it is, a secular state just like our own, that allows people of different religious, religious convictions to live together in peace, or relative peace and harmony. And this is a central tenet of French republicanism, right? France is much like the U.S., a secular state that guarantees freedom of religion. Uh, there's a strict separation of church and state in France. Some people would argue it works differently than in the states. I'd be happy to answer questions about it. But there's separation of church and state, just like there is in, in, the, in the U.S. And during the French Revolution in 1792, France was the first European country to give Jews full civil rights. Uh, so it's symbolically important. And so the killing of Jews as Jews, because they targeted the, the terrorist targeted.
market is the Jewish supermarket on purpose, brings this into question because the objective was to increase religious tension very clearly between the Jewish community and other communities, notably the important Muslim community in France. Uh, and does provoke immigration to Israel, right, and recreate the Arab-Israeli conflict on French soil. And it's really interesting, I, I, by the time I'll come back to it later, France has the largest Muslim community in Europe, and it has the largest Jewish community in Europe, right? It has the third largest Jewish community in the world, right, after Israel, the U.S., is in France. The Jewish community is maybe six to 700,000 people, and about five to seven million Muslims, right? And so this thing, you didn't have this after the, first, the Second World War, right? After the Second World War, you had a smaller Jewish community because of the Holocaust. You had relatively few Muslims, under 100,000. So this is a new phenomenon, right? So this is a country whose religious landscape has changed dramatically since the Second World War, and the Muslim community is much more religious, right? It's a relatively religious community, and it finds itself in a nation that's super secular, certainly by American standards. Uh, so, one of the things that these attacks, the attack on this Jewish supermarket did is it led to sort of, the, the objective is to increase tensions between different religious communities, right? And to sort of question the close links between religious communities that exist within France. The second thing that, uh, that's at stake here is the whole question of freedom of the press, right? the stake in the attack on the satirical newspaper, Charlie Hebdo. Uh, now, it might seem banal that freedom of the press is central to French republicanism, right? In 1789, during the French Revolution, they wrote a, a declaration called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, and what does this, what does this declaration say? And it's still the preamble to the French Constitution. It says, I quote, free communication of thought and opinion is one of the most precious of the rights of men, right? And it's a real pitch for freedom of the press. And France has a long history over issues of freedom of the press. It's that history that largely takes place in the 20th century in court, much like it does in the States. So why did they attack Charlie Hebdo? And I'll show you some slides of Charlie Hebdo in, in a second, right? It's a satirical newspaper. It's irreverent. It's totally politically incorrect, but it's politically incorrect to everybody, right? It's offensive. It's offensive to lots of people. I don't know if you've ever run, uh, read The Onion. Sort of like The Onion, but on steroids. Uh, <laughs> and in 2006, Shalmi Abdul had reproduced 10, 12 caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad that had been published. Oh, okay, I forgot about these. When we go back, you probably can't see well, these are the, I don't know if we can turn down these lights in front. I thought about that, but I didn't want to punch you all in the dark. Good, that's better. Okay. So you can see this now. You can see this one if you can see it before. So I'll go forward. These are the demonstrations that took place after the attack on Chalmy Abdul. 1.5 million people in Paris. And this is the Place de la Pique in Paris. This is an important Republican monument. And here are the famous Danish cartoons that were published in a Danish newspaper. And these are satirical representations of the Prophet Muhammad. And the, the one that really created a lot of, uh, of tension was this one, because here he is with a bomb in his head, right? And so he assimilated in some way, shape, or form by a terrorist. Uh, and following the publication of these cartoons in Denmark, the, cart the Danish cartoonists had been threatened, you know, death threats, uh, with death threats, and they'd gone into hiding, right? And so in support, in their support, Charlie Hebdo in Paris republished this, right, in support of freedom of the press. And they came out with their own newspaper, so this is the cover of Charlie Hebdo, and it says, Mohammed overtaken by the fundamentalists, right? It's hard to be loved by the French, the French word for asshole. Uh, but it's sort of, they're, they're sort of criticized, they're, they're saying that gee, these terrorists love Muhammad, right, and he's complaining, right, that this is a terrible situation. Uh, and what's interesting is when they published the Danish cartoons, and when they published this, uh, 
the Union of Islamic Organizations in Prague, along with the Mosque of Paris, there's a very beautiful mosque in Paris that was built in the 1920s, filed a claim against the paper in court, right? Claiming that the caricatures, and I quote, were injurious and stigmatized a group of people based on their religion. Uh, but a court cleared the paper one year later for the trial, right? Finding that its satire was directed against a fraction of Muslims, which they called terrorists, and not the Muslim community as a whole. A few years later, Shelley Abu came out with a new version, another version, another cover that satired uh, Muslims and Islam called Sharia Abu, right? And it says, 100 lashes if you don't die of laughter. And it was a pun on the title of their own newspaper, right? Uh, and the same day that this issue was published, its offices were firebombed and its web pages were hijacked with the message, no God, but Allah. Uh, now, these cartoons, along with just about everything else that this newspaper publishes, raise, a, raise important limits about the limits of satire and about freedom of the press, right? And what's interesting is that the French courts have systematically backed Charlie Hebdo's right to publish these cartoons and right to basically publish whatever they want. And I'll come back to the whatever they want later because it's whatever they want within limits. Uh, what's interesting is that satirical representations of Muslims represented only a very small portion of Charlie Hebdo's cover pages or its inside cartoons. The newspaper is filled with satirical representations of the Pope, especially, and of Catholicism, Jews, but also the bulk of the weekly satire was directed at the French political class. If you look here, here it says, to the toilet with all religions, right? And you have the Bible, the Quran, and the Torah. Here you have uh, the, the uh, this is the Vatican, and it's all about the gay lobby, right? It's getting together to like the new pope, right? So it's really pretty bad taste. This is a one on the extreme right. What can we do against the extreme right? This is a picture of a man called Jean-Marie Le Pen, who was the leader of the French extreme right, who had a black hat, and he was often portrayed as a Nazi. And this is a picture of his daughter saying uh, she's trying to make the, her party more normal, more like a traditional party, and she's saying, I'm shaving my mustache. It's a reference to National Socialism, to Hitler. Uh, so you can see the bad case, right? There, you, could, you could say all sorts of terrible things about it. Uh, so these terrorists may have been motivated, right, by a desire to avenge caricatures of the prophet. Uh, but most people in France understood their attack as being one against freedom of the press. And that's why you have three million people who came out of the street. It was not in defense of this newspaper, per se, which they didn't read. Only about 50,000 people bought the newspaper each week, right? Uh, so the demonstrations were so huge because it was shocking to people in France to have journalists, however bad their taste might be, and cartoonists, slaughtered in their editorial offices, right? It's an attack on freedom of the press. And after the attack, Charlie Hebdo published again, and here you have the prophet with a sign that says, Je suis Charlie, and he says, everything is part of It's a great cover. Uh, and it sold seven million copies. So this newspaper that was on the verge of going broke, right, was sort of revived, unfortunately, in some ways, you know, the price was obviously too high. Uh, by these attacks. So, I want to take a second to talk a little bit about freedom of the press in France. Uh, because the press is free in France, much like it is in the, in the U.S., but it's also regulated. Uh, so you can't slander, and it's more regulated in, the, in some sense than in the state. You can't slander people, you can't slander individuals, you can't defame them. You're not allowed to incite hatred or violence towards people because of their origin, their sex, their ethnicity. You can't condone war crimes. Very important. And there are very specific laws concerning the Holocaust, uh, concerning Holocaust denials that are in the book in France that are linked to the legacy of the Second World War. So after the Second World War, right, where a significant number of French Jews, about 71,000, perished in the death camps, 
After the Second World War, the French passed laws that said that it's illegal to deny the existence of the Holocaust. Interesting. It's totally legal in the States. And anti-Semitic statements are very closely monitored. So if you make anti-Semitic statements in public or you publish them in the press, you should be dragged to court. And people are. The French extreme right has spent a lot of time in court because people have taken it to court because of anti-Semitic statements. And the reason I'm raising this is that there's a perception, and perceptions matter because some people think that there's a double standard, that it's possible to categorize Muslims as Islam, but one doesn't have quite the same freedom when it comes to Jews because of the laws of that Holocaust denied. It's really interesting. And so one could argue that laws that regulate how people talk about the past Right, the limit what people can say about the past do a disservice because they fuel the, the perception of a double standard, right? And in some way it would be better for the French state to make speech even freer than it is now, one could argue. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about the November attacks, which were different in nature. It was more classic case of terrorism. And talk a little bit about well, who are the terrorists, how we can understand these attacks historically. Okay? So the attacks in January, the attack against Shelley Booth targeted journalists, right, and cartoonists, and also Jews, right? Whereas the November 2015 attacks were indiscriminate, right, in nature. Sports fans, Parisians hanging out and having a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, or Parisians who were at a rock concert, right? Uh, and what's interesting about the November attacks is that the French president, who is not the same president today, was a man called François Hollande a moderate socialist, right, immediately declared after the attacks that France was at war and he sent uh, warplanes to bomb Syria, right, to bomb Islamic terrorists, to bomb ISIS in Syria. But this kind of matched the fact that this was primarily a case of domestic terrorism. Uh, oh, okay. I've missed some slides here because I didn't note down that I had it. So after Shall we those starts republishing? Let me go backwards just for a second. They, they then publish this cover, right, where you see the newspaper, which is a dog, right, holding a newspaper, that's being chased by all these people who hate it, right? The Pope, and a terrorist, very clearly an Islamic terrorist, represented as a wolf, right? This is the leader of the extreme right, a woman called Marie Le Pen. This is the former president of France, Nicolas Sarkozy. So everybody hates this newspaper and everybody stands it against it, okay? And one of the ways uh, that this is a cartoon that was published in uh, Le Monde, the leading French daily, after the demonstrations in support of Charlie Hebdo, after 1.5 million people turned out in the street. And so you have all these people, right? It, it looks sort of weird, right? I'm going the wrong way. Uh, you have all these people down here, it says, Je suis Charlie, but you have all these people leading Climbing over a barricade, this is Notre Dame in Paris, right? And they're all holding handcuffs, which are a symbol of journalism, right? That's journalist right. Uh, but this caricature and this, this woman in the middle is a woman, she's the effigy of the French Republic, right? Her name is Marianne, right? She's the allegory of the French Republic. In America, we have an eagle who's there when, you know, Obama or Trump speaks, he's got an eagle in the lectern. In France, that Allegory of the Republic is a female figure who's wearing right here a Phrygian cap. And the Phrygian cap was a symbol of freed slaves in Rome. And this cartoon was a direct take on a very famous, perhaps the most famous painting of the 19th century in France. It was a painting by a painter whose name is Eugène de la Croix at the top. It's called Liberty Leading the People. It was a painting that was banned in France for 30 years. You can see it if you go to Paris, it's in a museum called the Musée d'Orsay, the Orsay Museum, that has all this impressionist blah, 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 right? And, uh, I'm kidding. Uh, and what it represents is in France in 1830, there was a revolution. It was a very conservative monarchy that was overthrown, right? And replaced by a more moderate monarchy. So there were barricades in Paris for three days. And here this painting, what this painting represented is the French people, right? You have the female allegory of the Republic leading a street urchin, a member of the bourgeoisie, so a respectable citizen, right? And a worker who's there, bare chested, right? A strong worker. 
as they storm the barricades to overthrow the monarchy and establish a more fair regime. But it's very interesting that when he published this, this cartoon that picks up on this theme, it's exactly the same thing as a cartoon. These are journalists, right? They're representatives, journalists, who are defending the republic on the barricade, right? Which is the way it was understood. Okay, so let me come back to, I'll get to this in a second. I'll leave this up here for a second. Let me come back to the attack, to the November attack, right? So the president of France immediately orders the French Air Force to go bomb terrorists in Syria uh, because he claimed that this was the work of ISIS. Uh, but, in fact, it's really a case of domestic terrorism. That's what I want to argue today. There are links to ISIS, but it's really a case of uh, domestic terrorism. And the perpetrators of the attack, both against Shelley Abdul, but the perpetrators of the November attack were French citizens, born in France, right? Uh, there's one case the mastermind of the attacks in November was a man called Abed Amida Daoud, who was Belgian of Moroccan heritage. They're European citizens. That's really important. And what I want to emphasize, I just want to open a little parenthesis, is that terrorism is not a new strategy in Europe. It just didn't appear in the 1990s or in 2010. It has a long history in Europe. And these terrorist attacks need to be understood more within the long-term history of terrorism in Europe than something that was imported, right, say, from Iraq. The terrorists aren't peasants from Afghanistan. They're not, you know, people who were flown in from Syria, right? They're, they're connection. But they're not foreign terrorists operating on French soil. They're French citizens, okay? And that's really important, and it's really important that for people to come to terms with that in France. So let me go back a little bit, just give you a couple of historical pointers. In 1894, the president of France is assassinated by an anarchist terrorist. And you have a really important anarchist terrorist wave in late 19th century France, which we've forgotten about. There's a professor at Yale who wrote a book called The Dynamite Club, and he says, he argues how a bombing in saint Jacques Paris ignited the modern age of terror. Right? Some people will dispute that. Some people will say, ah, modern terrorism, at least in its European case, was born in the late 19th Russia, where you also have an important terrorist way. Okay? So it's not a new strategy. In the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s, if we jump forward, you have a very important terrorist wave in Germany. You have something called the Red Army Faction. In Italy, you have the Red Brigades, right? And these people are, they want to overthrow the capitalist system through terror, right? They claim to be authentic representation representatives of the working class, and through their terror activity, they're going to overthrow capitalism and institute something new. And they go out and assassinate politicians and judges and business executives. And you have a similar group in France, which is called Direct Action, which is not as powerful as the town Red Brigade, but which is still present in the 1970s. Uh, and the last case that we could think about historically is terrorism in the name of nationalism. Think of the IRA. Think of the Bosch terrorist group, which was known as ITA, right? Which operated largely in Spain, which, whose objective was an independent Bosch country. But they used terrorist, extensive terrorist activity, especially in Spain, in order to achieve their goals. So terrorism is not something new on the European political scene. And there's some people, uh, I'll try to explain what the link might be between these kinds of terrorism, right, and the present day terrorism. But as a, as a strategy, it's nothing new. What's different, one could argue, maybe, about the current wave of terrorists is that they're transnational in organization and in nature. Okay? They're not isolated in France. I'll talk about the web in a second, right? Plays a very important role. And in the 1990s, you have a new wave of terrorism that's going to replace this more sort of traditional, you know, the Red Brigade kind of terrorism in Italy. You have a new wave of terrorism or a new terrorist movement in Europe that's linked to Islam. Right? And it developed in France in the mid 1990s, starts up in Belgium too. Let me give you an example that's a bit further on. In 2012, so it's not that long ago, a man called Mohamed Mira, who was born in Toulouse in France, he's French. He's got both French and Algerian citizenship. 
executes three French soldiers to kill them in cold blood. And what's interesting is these three soldiers were all of North African heritage, right? Their parents had come from North Africa. And he later attacked a Jewish school in the city of Kubus, killing the director and three kids on the street, right? Uh, and he's later killed uh, in a police shootout. And similarly to the kosher supermarket attack, he targeted Jews as Jews. But he's also after the French military. Uh, so what I want to emphasize, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what, uh, what, what we can say about the terrorists who've been present in the 20 teens, I think what, what's important is that it's important to understand terrorism within a longer term history. Right? It's not something new, brand new, that sort of erupted all of a sudden and we don't know how to deal with it. It's, it's, a, it's not a new strategy in a lot of European countries. It takes different forms today. It latches on to different ideologies and perhaps religious beliefs. Uh, but the strategy remains pretty similar. One of the things here, I just put up some books that have come out recently right, about how people are talking a lot about terror and writing a lot about terrorism. This is a book written by a French specialist is down here, Terror in France, The Rise of Jihad in the West. And this is it's French. It was originally written in French. And what's interesting about there's a whole wave of people are writing about terrorism in Western Europe now. Kitez was originally an expert on Afghanistan. And uh, he worked with the Mujahideen. He was an anthropologist, I think. He went to work with the Mujahideen in the 1970s and 80s. And there are a lot, there are a whole set of scholars who worked on the Middle East who are now working on Islamic terrorism in the West, because it's an interesting conversion, if you could follow that. Okay, so what do we know about the terrorists who've been active on French soil for the past 10 or 20 years? Well, first, the number of terrorists is somewhat unknown. We know that about 1,500 French citizens have traveled to Syria, right, uh, to link up with ISIS, to participate in jihad, right, to train as terrorists, it's unclear. Uh, and some of them have returned, right? So it's a pretty significant number. And the percentage of the population, the percentage of Belgians who've gone to Syria uh, is higher. It's interesting. Uh, the number of actual terrorists on French or Belgian soil is relatively low, from what we know. Uh, although there's a network of sympathizers in the few thousand, right? Very similar when you look at the Red Brigades in Italy in the 1980s. A relatively small number, but a broad network of sympathizers, right? You need people who give you hideouts, money, stuff like that. So we're talking about the radicalization of a small group of people, a very small minority of people, right? Uh, and the number of those who are ready to engage in direct action is even lower, okay? That's important. The second thing we can say about them is that they're young, they're youngish, they're in their 30s typically, they're French citizens, they're born in France of immigrant parents, so parents who came to France largely from North Africa, came to France to work, right, they're former, they come from former French colonies, that's a whole different topic, but they, they came to France to work as laborers, they did, they did the dirty work that the French didn't want to do, they settled in France, dead kids. Their kids were French, went to French schools, etc. And these kids often had difficulties in, in school. They grew up in what we would call rough and tumble suburbs, because in France it's the suburbs that are sort of rough as opposed to, you know, in the States, it tends to be the inner city. Many were involved in petty crimes, right, and small time drug dealings before turning to terrorism. Uh, about half of them spent some time in jail for some or another reason. Uh, or maybe they've been condemned and have been out on bail. About half had traveled to Syria as a terrorist that were active. Some had been to Yemen, right, Afghanistan, or Pakistan. Uh, and the majority of them came from the French suburbs, so the French called the Bonjou. They grew up in housing projects, mostly in the French suburbs. And the third thing we know about them, and this is super interesting, is that about 25 to 35 percent of them are converts. So, French citizens who converted to Islam, right? They're about, we're not entirely sure, about 600,000 converts in France. If you look at conversion in France, the main conversions aren't people who are converting to Protestantism, right? Becoming Baptist or whatever. People converting to Islam. It's 
super interesting. And a very small number of those converts have turned to terrorism. One of the key men in ISIS is actually a French guy who was the son of a farmer in Normandy. And for God knows what reason, right, he became, he sort of converted. We, I mean, that, that makes sense. But then he became interested in violent action, went to Syria, and is now, again, I think he was killed last year, actually, in a U.S. military raid. Specifically targeted him, right? That's really interesting. Uh, so why did they do it? What? Why is it that we have this new wave of terrorism? And I like to throw out a couple of reasons. And I'm not. I'm not going to support one over. Well, maybe I will support one over the other. One explanation of radicalization is that it's generational, right? So the vast majority of these terrorists are second generation. Right? It's not the parents, the immigrants who first came to France from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, wherever, right? It's their children, right? A very in very, very small number. It, they're often one super interesting phenomenon is they're often brothers who act in concert, right? So the November attacks were carried out and the attacks by on Chalizou were carried out by two brothers, right? Think about the, the bombing attack in Boston. Brothers, the Tornado brothers, right? Uh, who became radicalized largely in the States, right? It's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, so there's virtually no first generation terrorists, right? Nor do they seem to, does there seem to be any third generation terrorists, right? So the, the third generation, no, it's largely second generation terrorists. Uh, so the Moroccans and Algerians who came to France in the 19th they're now grandparents, right? And their grandchildren have not turned to terrorism, from what we can tell. The second explanation, it's sort of the common explanation, is that terrorism has social roots, right? It's born of these young men are among the socially marginalized in French society, right? They live there, they live in poor areas of the country, they're they're the victims of discrimination, and that's really clear. Uh, so they revolt against a society which excludes them, right? And so they turn to petty crime, they end up in jail, where they become radicalized, right? A disproportionate number of inmates in France are Muslim. Uh, so there's a parallel with African Americans in the States. And in some cases, in uh, prison, they turn to a radicalized version of Islam, right? But it's part of that, you know, one the the social explanation is that, gee, this has social and economic causes. It's born of injustice, it's born of discrimination, right? Uh, and it's also born of victimization, right? So I am the victim of a society which excludes me, and this authorizes me to act in immoral ways towards society. Uh, and one could understand that. The third explanation is religion, right? You're probably thinking, well, where's religion in, in all this? Well, what's interesting is that the vast majority of them turned to religion late. They didn't grow up in religious households. Their parents were probably not that religious, right? They weren't active in mosques when they were 14, 16, and 18. Uh, and their, their stories are strikingly similar, right, when they're reconstructed. Their friends say, all of a sudden he grew a beard. He stopped drinking, right? He quoted the Quran all the time, but he never read it before. Their knowledge of Islam is often minimal sort of a vulgarized notion of Islam, and they become adept of a radicalized version of Islam online, right, or through a circle of friends, rather than through a local mosque, right? So under the guidance of an, of an imam, right, who would know, who would be able to impart uh, the teachings of the text, right? Uh, so they turn towards a sectarian Islam, and they become convinced that only religious violence, you know, sometimes a holy war can save Muslims. This is salvation, right? That's why they have to die. Western society can't be saved, right? So one explanation is religious. The third explanation is uh, religious. But I want to say two more things. If you think about, you know, I, I said, well, gee, we need to understand this historically. If you think back a little bit, in previous generations, right, the people who were heavily radicalized, right, claimed to incarnate Marxism for the interests of the working class, or they came to incarnate, you know, Irish nationalism or Basque nationalism. 
uh, and they turned to care in support of that project, right? And so today, you could argue that marginalized youth, they're not turning to nationalism or to Marxism. They're turning to radical Islam because it's their only option. It's the option that's out there that makes sense to them today. And some people argue that radicalization has become Islamicized. Right? So that, in fact, what's happening is that they become radicalized, right, in their, you know, they're upset with society. They become radicalized, and then they turn to Islam. And this is something that's true in the better part of Western Europe, right? Uh, they latch on to Islam once they become radicalized. They have no interest in living in a utopian Islamic society, right, because they're going to sacrifice themselves. Uh, in some way, they're, they're sort of millenarian. Argue. Sort of interesting, right? That they're uh, more millenarian than anything else. So, where did they become radicalized? And I've talked a little bit about this, but I'd like to say a, a couple more things. Uh, in the 1990s, so when this begins, and in the early 2000s, it was largely mosques, right? And they would, not necessarily under the direction of the local imam, but they'd meet other people. And they become radicalized in the local mosque. But then the time that mosques in France were sort of, there were no mosques. There was, very, there was only one mosque, probably in France in 1945, the Paris mosque. Right? But with the arrival of large numbers of Muslims, you have to build mosques. Right? But where do you find building mosques? It's super complicated because you have to find the money to pay. Uh, and these are relatively poor communities, right? And B, there's a lot of opposition in French society to building mosques, right? You can imagine. And so it's, it's, a, it's a huge area of tension. So just building a mosque is a, is a real statement. And a lot of mosques, if you walk around in the Paris suburbs, there are mosques everywhere, but you don't see them, right? Because they'll be in an old converted garage, they'll be in some basement somewhere. There are all sorts of locales that could be used as mosques, right? And they often don't advertise the fact that they're there, right? There are no big signs out there. Uh, so in the earlier stages, right, radicalization probably took place in mosques, right? Over the past 10 years, it's changed, in part because the police has gotten really savvy and put the mosques under surveillance, but also because of the West, right? A lot of these people have become radicalized on the West within a close circle of friends, or in prison, okay? But sites like Facebook, like Snapchat, uh, WhatsApp, Twitter, hundreds of websites that have all sorts of information, recordings about jihadism, right, have become, have played a really key role in the radicalization of youth. There are a lot of, there are kids, like 16-year-old kids that the, you know, the French border police have stopped, and they're on their way to Syria, right? And they, they figure out by retracing things that basically they were in their room. They were looking at all these websites and they became sort of quote unquote radicalized online. And then they got in touch with somebody in Syria who was also online, who may have been a French person who went to Syria, who encourages them to come, you know, to Syria and to fight and to enter paradise, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, but these are people with very little religious knowledge who become radicalized online. Right? It's a completely new universe. It's really interesting. Uh, and it's really clear that sites like Facebook and Snapchat have played a very important role in the diffusion of, uh, and in helping terrorists, right? And in, in the diffusion of, you know, ideologies, sort of violent ideologies. And they haven't done much about it. Uh, they're not that, you know, it, it was, it would upset probably their profit model to do something about it. Uh, one of the things that we can talk about, just in terms of taking a, a break, so these are spies about terror in Paris. These are uh, covers of French newspapers after the November attacks in Paris, and this is essentially Madrid that says, I am Paris after these attacks. This is what Charlie Hebdo published after the November terrorist attacks. You can see how their humor is often uh, problematic. It says, it says they have weapons, but through them we've got champagne. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that the French state has done in, you know, has done in in return, or has they tried to address the whole problem of radicalization. I 
and they're actually posters in France. You can see them, and ads on TV about radicalization. And this is a poster, French government poster. It's about, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. It says, stop jihadism, right? And it says, violent radicalization, right? Uh, enrolling in some kind of jihadist organization, family, friends, do something before they leave, right? Be aware of what your kids are doing or, you know, your adult kids are doing, right? Pay attention. Uh, and here you can't, you can't see any of this, but these, this is a, this is a poster that says, these are the signs that could alert you, right? They stop seeing their friends, right? They stop seeing their family. They change their culinary habits, right? They stop going to school. They stop listening to music because uh, it turns them away from their mission. They don't look at TV anymore because there are all sorts of things that they're not allowed to see. They don't go swimming anymore because swimming pools bring both sexes together and they're not allowed to do that, etc. And they they look at all sorts of violent websites, right? If you have, and they sort of they on their own, right, and they become asocial. And if you see that, right, pay attention. Uh, and their ads on TV, this is one, right, and it says, they tell you, sacrifice yourself at our side, you will defend it just cause. In reality, you will discover hell on earth and you will die alone, right, far from home. Uh, there's actually, there are all sorts of, as you know, the war against the quote unquote war against ISIS has evolved. There are lots of European, you know, European rights to sort of join the fight with ISIS in Syria who've been stuck. We're stuck in Syria and the European countries don't want them back. So they've been arrested by the Iraqis in Syria. The European countries don't want them back even though they're their citizens. It's interesting. You have families, you have people who left with their kids and everything. It's it's a really interesting question. Okay. So I'd like to I think I, okay, we'll move on to this in a second. I just want to say a few things, just by way of conclusion. Uh, but think about, well, how does this fit? These are a small number of people, right? But how does this fit into broader development in French society? Now, one of the things that's really remarkable is that after 2015, right, one would have expected a spike, a spike in hate crimes directed against Muslims in France, right, as a reaction against these terrorist attacks, right? And there's been a growth of hate crimes in France directed against Muslims, but also directed against Jews, right? Uh, there's been a growth of these hate crimes, pretty regular growth since the early, since the 1990s. And the French state actually has an office that tracks these crimes, and they publish all sorts of statistics, which are interesting to look at. So what's interesting is that after 2015, hate crimes actually declined. That was really puzzling, and it shows that the French national community was actually pretty united, and the people in France realized that, gee, this isn't about the Muslim community as a whole. This is about, you know, a few individuals, right, who happen to be Muslim and who claim to be acting in the name of Islam, but we shouldn't blame the entire Muslim community. And that's interesting. Uh, it's interesting because the fear was that this would increase tensions between Muslims and Jews, between Muslims and the rest of the national community. And it hasn't. It hasn't changed that much. It's one, one way to think about it. On the other hand, right, the, the, the other way to think about it is to think about how the extreme right, the French extreme right, has responded to this. And the French, France has filmed a very powerful extreme right wing movement. It was founded in the 1980s headed by a man called Jean-Marie Le Pen. Uh, and he was succeeded by his daughter, Marie Le Pen, who's a very talented and intelligent politician. And the extreme right has made the fear of Islam one of its bread and butter issues, very clearly. And it's interesting, because uh, in the 1990s, this was a party that started out by being deeply anti-Semitic. Right. But then Father once famously declared that the concentration camps didn't exist, right? He denied they existed. He said that the gas chambers were just a figment of people's imagination, right? And he's made countless anti-Semitic statements. But the party, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, which was interesting, started abandoning its anti-Semitic tone. Good thing used to sell 
make, used to make money by selling records with Nazi songs on them, right? That's one of the ways he funded his party. But in the late 1990s, what's interesting is that this party slowly abandons anti-Semitism and starts turning its hatred on Muslims, probably because they thought that it would pay, right? It would pay more our call dividends dividends to go after Muslims, right, than it would to go after Jews. And in fact, it's sort of odd, there's the French National Front actually now has friends among Israeli conservatives, right? It's interesting. Uh, so it's become a really sort of, I wouldn't say anti-Muslim party, but it's a party that sort of lives, whose bread and butter is a constant uh, drumbeat that immigrants are undermining French society, that there are too many immigrants in France, too many illegal immigrants in France, we have to push them out of the country, that France is for the French, right, which is an old saying that goes back to the 19th century. Uh, and you can see it very well, uh, and the implication is often that Muslims are linked to criminality, Im immigrants are linked to criminality, right, Muslims are linked to criminality, Muslims are linked to Islamic fundamentalism, and Islamic fundamentalism is linked to terrorism. And all these parts of the equation are really problematic because there isn't much evidence to suggest that it's really the case. Uh, but you can see, for example, in these slides from these are posters from the French National Front, it says stop to you know this huge onslaught, right, of migration, right, and it represents people of Muslim faith very clearly. Here, this is Le Pen Sr. with a poster, a campaign poster that says no to Islamism, right? And what does it show? It shows a woman in a burqa, right? You see a French flag, right? But this is, this is the outline of France, but this is the Algerian flag that's been put on France, right? And these are minarets of mosques, but that are made to look also like missiles, right? So you can see how he's trying to stir up all sorts of things, and he's trying to link very clearly terrorism, right, to Islamicism, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, here, this is a poster, I took this photograph in a southern town of Marseille, maybe 20 years ago, it was a wall. It was on a wall, and it's unclear who edited this, but it's probably somebody who was close to the French National Front. And you can say, uh, it says at the top, inshallah, God willing, right, you know, the, the outlines of Amar. And it says, it quotes, right, an Islamic uh, 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 chief down here, he's unknown. And the quote says, in 20 years, it's certain France will be an Islamic republic. Right, that's the feel, that France will be transformed into an Islamic republic. Uh, so, and Le Pen himself has declared on a number of occasions, and I can quote him here in Marseille once, he said, as long as we live, France will never be. So this fear of Islam, of radical Islam, et cetera, et cetera, is really key to the French National Front. And the anti-immigrant card works well because a lot of the terrorists, even though they're French, right, for the National Front, it's their foreign background, many generations, one generation, two generations back, which really is important. And what's interesting is that after, even before and after the 2015 attack, this was a party that proposed to put suspects in camps to intern people who were suspected of terrorism. You didn't need any evidence. They wanted to strip terrorists of French citizenship, right? They wanted to put a halt to immigration altogether, a halt to naturalization, right? Uh, and even to strip French citizens who were, quote unquote, convicted of, French, of terrorism, of their French citizenship. And what's interesting is that there was an election two years ago in France when, where Marine Le Pen was the, uh, in the final election, it was the current president of France, Emmanuel Macron, against Marine Le Pen, and she did relatively poorly, right? And she ran, there were all sorts of problems with her campaign, but one of the things she ran on was an anti-immigrant platform. One of the things she ran on was an equation of terrorism and Islam platform. And that didn't, it didn't work that well, right? And that's interesting. Uh, a lot of people thought that it would work a lot better. Uh, so, I think one of the things that the 2017 elections in France showed is that this kind of radical right-wing discourse has limits, maybe, at least in the present. So, let me just say a few words by way of conclusion, and then we can think about some questions. I think that's it.
Wow. Oh, here's one more. Here is the leader of the extreme right wing party, Nabi the Ben, right? And she says, in the face of Islamic terrorism, we have to control our borders. We have to close radicalized mosques. So we basically have to close mosques. We have to expel radical imams, right? How do you define a, a radical imam? We have to expel people who are suspected of terrorism. We have to stop migration. We have to expel people who were denied the right to asylum, and we have to give more means to the police. We need to act fast, right? So you can see the kind of discourse that this produces. So, just to summarize, I think for, for me the question is are the roots of this current terrorist wave in Europe, right? And it's not clear that it's come to an end. We'll, we'll only know that in, in a while. Are they historical? Is this part of a long standing? presence of terrorism in Europe, and it's just taking a different form today, right? Uh, or are the roots rooted more in the present, right? Maybe it's both. Are they religious roots? I'm not sure they are. Or are they social roots, right? And there's a strong argument for that. Is radicalization different today because of social media than it was in the past, right? Is the way people become radicalized different than it has in the past? Uh, and one of the things that's interesting is that since 2015, in 2015, when I was talking about this earlier, there were all these big debates in France about freedom of the press and how it was under attack, right, and how the nation would react toward terrorism. And there were also uh, all sorts of discussions about the social question, poverty, discrimination, and perhaps lots of terrorism as well. And all that seems to have disappeared. It's interesting. And it's been replaced by nuts and bolts strategy on the part of the state. I don't know if you read the New York Times, there was an article, I think yesterday, it was, or two days ago, about, gee, there's not that much terrorist activity in, in Europe anymore. Why is that? And their argument, the argument of the article was, well, because the counter-terrorist police in Europe has become much more active and efficient, right? So, you don't have to deal with social problems, you don't have to deal with these issues, you just need a stronger police presence, perhaps. So, it's, you know, my question, I, I, I would sort of end it by saying, well, it's, you know, it may be a good thing that European states have stronger counter-terrorist, uh, a stronger counter-terrorist presence, but it's not clear that that's actually going to solve the problem. Uh, so I'll end there and see if you have questions. The second generation found themselves in France with parents who were super isolated, right, or relatively isolated, who really who didn't have many links with their home country anymore. Uh, there was a lot of opposition with their parents, right? Whereas the third, in the case of the third generation, they're pretty assimilated. With, I'm not sure I like the word assimilation, but they're they're fully part of French society. Uh, there are all sorts of polls, the French take a lot of polls that have been taken about the French Muslim community that show very clearly that over time the kinds of values that Muslims have in France, and most Muslims in France today are, are you know, not that far back or foreign origin, the values, the further on you go in terms of generation, their values are more or less the same as those of French citizens. You know, but, but their values on, I don't know, Prussian abortion, or, you know, any of those kinds of values and issues. So that over time, uh, they become just more, they're, they're, they have the same range of opinions about things, right, within the same sort of boxes as French citizens. Yes? Um, I was surprised that you didn't refer more to movements or re reactions outside of France. Is, is there a reason for that, or was this, was this mostly a French issue? Well, the, the Germans and the Danes and the Belgians just said that's their problem? Right, well, there are lots of, I, I just wanted to use specific examples. I think my argument would be that terrorism in Belgium and Holland and Great Britain, you probably have a similar explanation, right? It's not that different. When you were saying outside of France, I was thinking, well, why aren't you talking about Syria, right? And that's 
So one of the questions is, what is the relationship between these domestic terrorists, right, and terrorists in the Middle East? And there's, there's a connection between the two. And sometimes they're following orders that emanate from the Middle East, right? But they're still, so it's sort of a transnational phenomenon. It's just not happening in a Belgian bubble or a French bubble, right? There's, there's a link between international, Middle Eastern terrorism and European terrorism, very clearly. Uh, there's an organizational link, but it's sometimes not as strong as one thinks. And there are a lot of, some of these terrorists are just acting on their own, largely, right? They're inspired by things that might be happening in Syria, but they're acting on their own. Yeah? Sir? Maybe she, or she grew up with something else, which is that the separation of the church and state in France, but the struggle against the church, and notably the Catholic Church, was very powerful in the 19th century. So there was always this fear that if the church had too much influence, and the church was a really conservative power, that the church was a danger to French democracy, right? And that's why, that's why there, there's these sort of lingering feelings about the separation. There are more than lingering feelings. Why the People understand the separation of church and state in France differently than we do in America, right? So a French citizen comes to America and he hears Obama say, God wants America. And you never hear the president of France say that because it would be a violation of the separation of church and state, right? The same with wearing religious symbols in public, right? You can't wear a veil to school, but you can wear it to university and burkas are banned. Period, right? So any kind of religious garb is seen as religious proselytizing. And if citizens are supposed to be equal, right, then we recognize no difference among them, including religious difference. It's sort of an interesting concept. On the other hand, this is crazy. You have a really big uh, school system, Catholic school system in France, which is heavily subsidized by the state. And the teachers are basically paid by the state, right? In America, people would go bananas, even conservatives. Maybe not, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> but there would be a lot of opposition to using federal or state money, right, to fund Catholic, Protestant, whatever schools, right? In fact, it's not an issue, and they're building Muslim schools now in France, which are going to receive extensive state support, right? You think that that's, it doesn't fall in the category of separation of Christians. So the way they think about the separation of church yeah, and state is different. different. Like she and I just, we can't right. understand each other. Right. But the, the other thing that's important is that there are more atheists in France than in any other country in Europe, including Sweden. So you have a society that has, has moved away from religion a lot. You go into a French, go to France, you're in France one day, you have nothing to do on a Sunday morning, you're in a medium sized town, go to a church. Right? You'll be there with a lot of little old ladies. And I don't mean that pejoratively, it's true, right? It's a great way to see it. Uh, because nobody else is, you know, the churches are empty. And so you have this sort of clash between this relatively newly arrived Muslim population, right? Some of whom are pretty, you know, faithful, right? Not all of them, right? But they're deeply, some of them are deeply religious with a Catholic population that is increasingly, that is Catholic culturally, but they're increasingly different from religion, right? And, that, that, and so for them, any kind of presence of religion in the public sphere is dangerous, you know, exactly. I don't think she has history. <laughs> so I don't. It's, 
Uh, well, it's a different kind of, I mean, there, there are parallels, but there are also differences between Trumpism and Tommy uh, Mazen. Uh, uh, because Trump, and I, I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask for the comparison, but for me, the, the difference is that, you know, Trump attached himself to the Republican Party, right? And he is now the head, um, the head of the Republican Party. You know, and they're going to go for broke on him, right? Either. Uh, but we're, so he's sort of, he managed to be the nominee of one of the two main political parties. So he's not marginal in that sense. Where she was long the head of this marginal party on the extreme right. The appeal, you know, the anti-immigrant appeal, yeah, is one that you see in a lot of European countries and to a certain extent in, in the States, right? Uh, even though, the, you know, what one of the things that France shares with the States, both less today, but say in the 1930s and even in the 1960s, the proportion of foreign born in France is even higher than it was in the United States. So people, France is, you know, in the U.S., we consider ourselves to be a nation of immigrants, right? It's part of the melting pot. It's part of the American. But it needs to be American in some way, right? And France is a melting pot, too. It's the only major country in Europe that has this long tradition of immigration going back to the 19th century. But the French don't consider that immigration is what made their country. But if you were to look at the heritage of most French citizens, probably 40% of them are of foreign origin in some way, shape, or form, right? They're, they're not not that there's anything like racial purity, but there's, you know, they're from everywhere in there, right? And that's changed. Um, sir? I'm kind of curious to know what the Muslim, the Muslim community in France actually is doing to condone or prevent what is actually happening. Because, for example, I think there was a attack in Belgium, and one of the attackers actually hit a Muslim community with their feet. Well, one of the things, one of the things that the Muslim community has done is, you know, they're really concerned that the leaders of the Muslim community have reached out to the leaders of the Jewish community and the Catholic community, and they, they work very closely together. It's, it's not a big issue, but they've done a lot to try to, you know, promote growing tolerance among the Muslim community. Uh, to they're working more closely on the training of imams, right? The whole question is how are imams trained, and there are a lot of some imams in France come from abroad, from Morocco or Saudi Arabia or Syria or wherever, because there are not enough French imams, right? And so there's always been the suspicion that some of them are more radicalized than others. So they're they're making efforts to train French imams. Uh, so it's it's a you can imagine, right? If you're a French Muslim, it's a huge concern, right? You got to be. But, you know, it's, it's hard to control the, you know, it's almost like saying, well, the communist parties in Europe were sort of responsible, had some responsibility for the Red Brigade, but what could they do? You know, there's sort of people who are out of here, the terrorists have sort of fallen out of your control. It's hard to prevent in that sense. We have time for one more. Sure. Go well, ahead. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know, but my, you know, my sense is that this kind of violence, I mean, you see this kind of violence in the States, too, right? And it's not just, I mean, there was a very famous attack in, uh, it was a case of extreme right-wing terrorism in Norway, right, where this nut, you know, uh, went onto this island and killed all these people at this socialist summer camp, right, hundreds of people. So it's not necessarily, it's not relegated. It's a strategy that can be used by different political groups or different ideological groups. It just so happens that today it's a strategy that's been used much more, that radicalization is something that the link between radicalization and Islam has been more powerful than, say, the link between radicalization and the extreme right. But I certainly, I, you know, it's pretty clear that terrorism in some way is going to continue. Right? It's not going to disappear, but it's going to morph into different things, right? And it's going to latch on to other religions or political ideologies in that way. It's, it's very plastic. One, I'll take one more. Uh, is there right? Well, I like the connection that there has not been any increase in the terrorist uh, reporting. Right. But it's a kind of program. Okay, right, 
that's a different, that's, that's a different, right. So one of the things that you raise a really important question. The question is, you know, there's evidence that shows that while the French Jews have been victimized or have been the target of, of acts of discrimination by Muslims. One of the things that's interesting is that over the past 10 years, you've had in certain Paris suburbs the, the sort of recreation of the intifada, right? And so that you have young Muslim, young French citizen who are of you know Muslim background, who knows how faith, how religious they are, has no clue, right? Who take it out on Jews, right? So they'll throw rocks at a bus carrying Jewish kids to a synagogue or to school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so there's been increasing religious tension. That's very clear. Uh, but this is different than terrorism, right? There's been increasing tension, community tension, right? And you see it very clearly if you, if you were to look at where it is that people live. Uh, there were some cities north of Paris, suburbs north of Paris, where you had very large Jewish communities and very large Muslim communities, and the Jews have started to move away. It's interesting. Uh, but the number of Jews who've emigrated to Israel, the Israeli government claims that it's growing, but in fact it's been pretty stable, the number of Jews in France who've gone to Israel, especially if you look at the ones who later come back, right? Uh, but the Israeli government has put a lot of emphasis on this, saying that you know, Jews were no longer safe in France because of the risk of harassment, et cetera, et cetera, from, without naming them, you know, Muslims in France. So there is growing antagonism, but a lot of people see it, it's less linked to things like ISIS than it is a spillover of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict where sort of young marginalized, not necessarily much marginalized, but young Muslims who are discriminated against. It's very clear, right? They sort of identify with the Palestinians in some way, right? You can understand that, and thus they turn against Jews. It's really, it's interesting to, to, to think about. Good. Well, thank you.